Yeah, 24 years ago, uh, I picked up a book by Niccolò Ricciardini on the reception or the development of Newtonian calculus in Britain, 1700 to 1800. And I thought this is a, a very original and very interesting uh, work which takes a completely new view of something that everybody thought was decided and settled long ago. And I've read many of Niccolò's papers since, and they're very incisive and very interesting representations of uh, mathematical development, mathematical physics, um, types of mathematics, and, and other, th other aspects of uh, Newtonian and other work of the period. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing about the second edition of Newton's Principia, Mathematica 1713. Uh, Niccolo is, of course, an associate professor at the University of Bergamo, and uh, I think you've been there for several years, is it? Yeah, seven years. Seven, seven years. years. Okay. So, over to you, Niccolo. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for <laughs> and thank you for the invitation and for the survivors who are here <laughs> to listen this this uh, open seminar that was meant, well, I, I tailored it as a seminar addressed not only to the specialists, but also to the <laughs> students <laughs> of, of this university. So um, um, this will be uh, a bit uh, perhaps boring for you because I'm, I'm not going to say uh, new things, but I will care about the seafood that is waiting for us and so don't worry that uh, <laughs> uh, it won't be <laughs> it won't uh, spoil the, the the rest of the day that we have to spend together and um, in any case um, uh, thank you to the organizers for having invited me here because I'm learning a great deal I think that as a historian of Newton's uh, mathematics and uh, natural philosophy I'm very interested in learning more about, about yes, the second edition of the Principia that ended with uh, the, the general scolium. And when Stephen invited me and Scott and, and Stephen invited me here, it occurred to me that uh, this is the tercentenary also of the Commercium Epistolicum. And uh, when I was asked uh, to present a story about uh, the making of the second edition, I thought that it might be a good idea to study these two synchronous events because if you think the Commercium Epistolicum is the result of John Keel's paper read in 1708 and then there is blah blah blah, there are no students here so I can <laughs> skip the details and then there is the, there is the Commercium Epistolicum. And uh, as far as we know, Richard Bentley approached uh, Newton with some uh, um, advancements in the second edition in 1708. And uh, you know, in those five years, Newton was busy in improving his Principia, and he was also busy uh, in, uh, at a certain moment, in editing the Commercium Epistolicum. So um, why are these two debate? Uh, why is the second edition of the Principia related to the Commercium Epistolicum for a series of reasons? One is that the mathematical methods that Newton employed in the Principia are somewhat difficult to interpret. And in the context of the priority dispute uh, on the calculus, what Newton the methods that Newton used in the Principia became the object of criticisms and defense. Um, algebraic symbols rarely occur in the Principia. If you open a page, I opened a very special page here of the Principia, you find diagrams and you find reasonings that are related to the diagrams. You find these letters here that refer to lengths of segments, let us say so. So PS will be the length of uh, the segment PS, for instance. And everything is done in geometric terms. But now I will 
problematize a little bit this by showing that Newton's geometry is, in some sense, that is difficult to define related to what we call calculus. Now, all these matters are a bit ambiguous. As a historian, I, I didn't try to answer the questions that concerns the use of calculus in Newton's Principia, because these questions are ambiguous because the terms that we use are um, indeed uh, historic terms that had a development and uh, it's difficult to ask whether the calculus is in the Principia. There is nothing like the calculus that you can find there. The calculus is actually what we call calculus is the result of a development that uh, uh, several generations of mathematicians contributed to this development. And uh, of course, Newton and Leibniz made important contributions, but it's difficult to say what it is, the calculus. It's uh, a series of methods, notations, theorems. And uh, as a historian, I found that it was more interesting to study how these questions was debated by historical actors in order to understand something about their agendas, something about their ideas. In any case, as you all know, Newton dealt in some parts of the Principia with limit of ratios of vanishing quantities. And uh, I have here uh, enlarged this detail, you can see here this arc PQ of a trajectory traced by a body. And then we have two segments QR, which is parallel to this line here, and QT, which is orthogonal to this line here. Um, so Newton asks us to conceive Q as fluid in its position, and he asks us to think about Q as moving, flowing, towards P until Q coincides with P. Well, as Q moves towards P, the length of the arc PQ gets smaller and smaller until it gets zero. And the same holds true for these two segments here, which vanish, disappear, when Q uh, coincides with P. Now, Newton didn't write these things. I, I wrote it in red because it's a big mistake for an historian to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to use these things. We shouldn't do this. And this is also a problem that, as historians of mathematics, we often, often have. It's the problem of anachronism. And we get worried about uh, this anachronism, but um, in using modern notation in order to read the past text. But in a way, it is inevitable. We shouldn't be too worried, provided that we know what we do, provided that we use a red ink, let us say so, to mark <laughs> these things. In any case, uh, Newton would have written it in words. He would have said that the limit as Q tends to P until Q coincide with P of the ratio QT over QR, and he would have written QT over QR. Well, this limit, uh, um, uh, is infinite because as uh, these two uh, lengths get smaller and smaller, this ratio gets bigger and bigger, let us say so. So uh, this is not a nice thing because we want a finite limit. And uh, the way to tame this ratio is to raise the length qt to the squared. And in this case, the limit is finite and everything works well. Now, why did I make this example? It's the only example, mathematical example. Uh, there will be another one, but uh, very brief. Why did I make this example? It is very simple, and we understand from our high school that uh, there are concepts in, in Newton's geometry that uh, characterize somehow what we call calculus, the notion of limit, uh, the fact that we are calculating limit of ratios, and the fact that we are classing infinitesimals into uh, higher order classes. Uh, this behavior of this ratio means that QR tends to zero much quicker than QT. So it's a higher order infinitesimal relative to QT. So that's the end of the mathematics, which explains why we are so few in this room, of course, because <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, yes, algebraic symbols rarely occur in the Principia, but the geometry of the Principia is framed in a way that allowed people who had an interest in defending Newton to claim that Newton knew the calculus in 1687. But uh, the kind of geometry that Newton uses in the Principia offered also a chance to those who had an interest in attacking Newton to say that no, Newton didn't have at least the higher parts of calculus in 1687. And when I say those who defend Newton and those who attack Newton, I mean a whole variety of people who entered the debate with different agendas and different ideas. So uh, the, there were no two groups fighting, uh, you know, with uh, Leibniz's watchdogs and Newton's watchdogs. The, the, the situation was much more complex. In any case, the second edition of the Principia begins, <coughs> as you all know, quite early. After having printed the Principia, Newton, who was in possession of a very strange character, I, I would be happy to have written the Principia, but he began thinking that he had <laughs> to revise it. And uh, in, the, in the 1690s, Newton began rethinking from scratch certain aspects of the Principia. In the 1690s, Newton, in his uh, 50s, was still a very active mathematician. There is a story that Newton kitted mathematics uh, early in order to devote himself to other pursuits. But just a look at the spines of Whiteside's edition of Newton's Mathematical Principia shows you, and you don't have to open them, that he was <laughs> doing things. <laughs> yes. And what he did in the 1690s is notable. Uh, uh, there are, to, to make things simple, three things that Newton did in this period. One is to work on geometry, and one of the great contributions of Tom Whiteside is to show us how um, uh, deeply involved into ge geometry was Newton during his uh, intellectual career, especially in this period. He had this idea of divining the method of the ancients, the, uh, the method of discovery of the ancients. Um, but there are two other uh, things that are important. One is quadratures. It is in this period that Newton actually wrote one of his masterpieces in integration. And uh, from my mouth, a red word is coming <laughs> out now. <laughs> integration, right. Okay. The De Quadratura Curvarum. Uh, he worked hard on it. And then Newton worked on the Principia. He, uh, he revised the Principia in several ways. And what is interesting for the point of from the point of view that we are taking here is that in this uh, period, Newton showed an interest in applying his method of fluxions to motion, to certain problems of the Principia. So, uh, and he did so even in version of the Quadratura. If Whiteside is right in his reconstruction of the preliminary, uh, preliminary version of the Quadratura, because Whiteside um, pa uh, pastes together four manuscripts, and he says by authority that these four manuscripts <laughs> form a whole thing, but uh, uh, you know it's good to trust, of course, uh, a scholar as Whiteside, but. Uh, he forgot <laughs> to explain us why <laughs> they are. <laughs> but uh, of course, with the Newton project, we will be able to see soon this manuscript and verify by ourselves. In any case, in one of these manuscripts of the De, de Quadratura, Newton ends the manuscript, uh, um, ends the De Quadratura with some problems uh, which concern motion. And there, he uses the dotted notation to represent uh, force. For instance, he says that force is proportional to x with two dots on it, where x is uh, the displacement of the body. So he goes, uh, I mean, I don't want to say that he writes f equal ma. It is, uh, it is untrue. But what I want to say is that he uses his own method of fluxions in order to mathematize his dynamics. So, so the man who came to know this 
And it's very easy because I don't have to explain anything here because you all know <laughs> Scott <laughs> here knows very, very well about Fazio. So the man here uh, that came to know very well about Newton's um, researches in this period is Fazio de Duillier. Uh, in the early 1690s, Fazio became um, aware uh, of Newton's work on quadratures and Newton's work on a second edition of the Principia. So he began corresponding with Huygens and probably Fazio was very interesting for Newton also because he was uh, an acolyte of Huygens. So Newton probably looked with admiration to this man because could be a trait d'union with uh, the great uh, uh, Dutch polymath. And um, Fazio de Duillier began telling Huygens that Newton had uh, quadrature techniques or integration techniques that were very powerful and that he was revising the Principia and that uh, there was an idea that Newton was working to a second edition. Huygens was very happy about that. There is a moment in which Fazio proposed to Huygens to be the co-editor <laughs> of, <laughs> of an edition of Newton's Principia. It would, be <laughs> it would have been a great <laughs> work to, to have, but uh, they, they didn't do it. But, um, um, but um, um, Fazio was uh, thus um, um, circulating this idea of a second edition. He was somewhat, he would have been somewhat um, a dangerous editor, I think, for many reasons. For his ideas on gravity, but for the point of view of mathematics, also because he was claiming a lot for himself. He was a good, I mean, he was, you know, a person who could understand higher mathematics, but he was claiming in his correspondence with Huygens a lot for himself. Maybe Newton looked, you know, behind Fazio while he was writing to Huygens and he realized that this guy was a bit ambitious, too ambitious perhaps. Um, there are manuscripts by Fazio, uh, the notes uh, at the Royal Society, there are material at the Bodleian, there is the uh, manuscript in Basel, there is the material in Geneva. So we need a PhD student who works on Fazio and, and tells us something about these annotations. In any case, the pattern here is this. Fazio is interested in integration and in the second edition of the Principia. And he understands that these two are related fields. Indeed, in 1699, when he's not a friend of Newton any longer, in his Investigatio Geometrica Duplex, de devoted to the brachistochrone and the solid of least resistance in appendix, Fazio uh, answers late <laughs> the problem that Johann Bernoulli had posed to the sharpest mathematician in Europe, as you know. But he adds an appendix in which a problem, a very difficult problem, dealt by Newton in the Principia, is solved by means of the fluxional method. And uh, uh, in the Principia, Newton provides a solution of the solid of least resistance, but he proceeds as follows. He says, let us find the solid of least resistance. This is the solid of least resistance. So that's what <laughs> Newton writes in the Principia. Okay. So that's why the Principia is so difficult to read sometimes, because Newton, as uh, the historian of astronomy Bailly said, uh, spoke as prophets, uh, à la manière des prophètes. <laughs> so he's, uh, you know, he, he sometimes tells you what the solution, but not what the method. And, um, Fazio, in, the, in this work, the Investigatio Geometrica, not only, uh, much to uh, Leibniz's uh, chagrin, claims in a very strong way that I've seen Newton's manuscript, he'd invented the calculus, he has methods of quadrature that are very powerful. He not only initiates, in a way, the priority disputes, but he adds um, 
a problem taken from the Principia dealt with in fluxional terms. So you see, the pattern is this. I know Newton. I can read through, not the scolium, but through, <laughs> well, the scolium to proposition 35 in book, <laughs> in book two, and I know that Newton is using the method of fluxions. I am his acolyte. I can explain you that Newton has a, you know, a, a different register in which he explains and which he proves things. Now, David Gregory steps after, and uh, David Gregory, as you all know, uh, um, had problems with Newton. I will not go into this detail because I do not have time to do so. But he, in a way, substituted Fazio as the man who had an extraordinary free access to Newton's manuscripts. I don't know why Newton was so open with David Gregory. Uh, Newton allowed, since 1694, David Gregory to have open access to his manuscripts. And David Gregory, as you know, wrote uh, this wonderful memoranda in which we know a lot about Newton. But before meeting Newton, David Gregory, in s from 1687, began writing the Note in Newtoni, Principia Mathematica. These uh, notes are held at uh, the Royal Society, and uh, they are a wonderful manuscript, a 200 folio manuscript, uh, in which David Gregory does more than Fazio, he comments line by line the Principia. He writes here a few words, and then he comments, and he goes on to comment line by line the Principia. His commentary is written in the style of Van Schoten's commentary of the geometry, and uh, there is a moment in which David Gregory relates his work to Van Schoten. It was, uh, you know, uh, a clever thing to do, to be the person who could open the Principia to the understanding of the Republic of Letters, you see. And this was what um, uh, David Gregory wanted to do. But when you read uh, the Note again, you find Gregory writing, oh, this problem can be solved with my own mathematical method. And uh, he very often refers to his own. Well, that's, after all, he was a mathematician, and he was happy to see that some of his methods could be applied to Newton's Principia. Even though some of these methods uh, were the result, it seems, of a plagiarism <laughs> that Gregory, Gregory had, <laughs> because John Craig had visited Newton in 1685, and then this uh, Scott mathematician had uh, moved to Edinburgh, and there Gregory had uh, uh, came, uh, uh, had uh, uh, copied a theorem on integration by Newton and published it in Archibald Pitcairn's works. And when Gregory became civilian professor in Oxford, Wallace had a very hard time when he published his opera to uh, make room both to Newton's works and Gregory's works. And <laughs> there are some difficult, uh, uh, very, very political uh, uh, sentences that Wallace writes in this respect. In any case, Gregory's note are here, and uh, Gregory, in his memorandum of uh, July 1694, says several things about the Principia. In the new edition of Newton's philosophy, uh, there will be many corrections. To this edition, the author will attach two treatises, which are a treatise on the geometry of the ancients, which would be a development of section four and five of, Newton's of book one of Newton's Principia. Because one of the funny things about uh, the Principia is that you have these two sections whose main purpose is to prove a theorem, Papus theorem, that um, Descartes had used uh, in the geometry as proof of the superiority of his method over the method of the ancients. 
in the geometry, Descartes had had a very aggressive attitude towards the ancient. It's uh, amazing what Descartes says, because Descartes says the ancients wrote very long books like the elements because they didn't have a proper method. Instead, I can write a very short book because I have a new method which works better. And look, I can solve Papu's problems very effectively and very generally, you know. So Newton, in section four and five, uh, gives a geometric proofs of Papu's problem. Qualem veteres querebant, as, as we, which the ancients desired. And uh, Newton uh, uh, had this idea of adding uh, a treatise on the geometry of the ancients to the Principia, uh, which would have increased uh, this uh, ancient looking aspect of the text. But he had also the idea of adding his method of quadratures, uh, his method of integration, because as, um, uh, this is a translation from Latin, because as Gregory says, on these quadratures depend certain more abstruse parts of his philosophy, as it had to published, such as corollary three, proposition 41, and corollary two, proposition 91. So David Gregory was aware that uh, Newton was using integration techniques that listen, th these integration techniques that Newton was using in the Principia were in place in 1671. So he had already these integration techniques before writing the Principia. And uh, this statement is interesting because, uh, you know, David Gregory, in his note, I mean, a person who had read the Principia line by line, knew that in certain point, these methods of integration, this quadrature method, were required. And this uh, uh, tells us also that for Newton, the, uh, the method of fluxion was not the method that was necessary to frame the whole thing. It was a method that Newton needed only in a few instances. And in these instances, people could not understand what Newton was doing, because typically in corollary three to proposition 41, Newton does the following. There is a little bit of mathematics. It is the last thing. Newton does the following. He is interested in studying the motion of a body which moves attracted by a central force which varies as the inverse of the cube of the distance, not the inverse of the square of the distance. He reduces this problem to quadratures, as we would say nowadays. And then he says, by the quadrature of a curve, which being easy enough for the sake of brevity, I omit, the, the, the trajectory <laughs> are this. And he gives a, a note. So when David Gregory annotates the, the note, there he leaves half page blank and goes ahead. Then he meets Newton and he can paste the solution. And the solution is this famous letter. And I had the very wise idea not to go into details because it's difficult to read. But this is how Newton explains to Gregory how to prove uh, corollary three to proposition 41. The only thing I would like you to see is that uh, Newton refers to a specific page of book one of the Principia. And then these little symbols, which denotes lengths of segments, is associated to uh, an algebraic symbol. So CD will be the distance of the body from the center of force and is denoted by X. So for instance, Hilary, I am the center of force. You are the body, let us say so, and uh, the distance between me and you is not uh, CD, is X. And I am attracting you with a force which varies with the inverse of the cube of the distance. Here is the formula. So Newton is uh, using algebra here. And uh, for those who like mathematics, you can see that Newton calculates an area here that is, he performs an integration of this simple function and obtains uh, this expression, which is wrong, by the way. He, 
the two should be at the denominator. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I mean, he, he made a little mistake. But uh, you know, he calculates the integral of the force over distance, what we call the work. And he says that the velocity, he says that the velocitas est ut the square root of this stuff here. So uh, for those who know uh, a little bit of calculus, this means that Newton is stating something that looks very much like the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. And, from and then he proceeds and then uh, reduces the problem of quadratures. One quadrature, the, the one that gives you the time in function of, uh, okay, but one quadrature is easy, another quadrature is difficult, and, uh, and that's it. So, but why I'm interested in this? Because here we see Newton using a different linguistic register, so to speak. He's addressing an acolyte, he's explaining something to him. Roger Coates steps in. Okay, and I have to be quick with Roger Coates, unfortunately, because uh, we don't have too much time. Roger Coates uh, is, as you know, a uh, Plumian professor of astronomy in Cambridge. He begins a cooperation with Newton that, is, uh, that leads the elderly Newton into a process of, uh, you know, he is uh, happy to cooperate with Coates and uh, uh, the, the the correspondence between the two shows us Newton uh, still active in uh, revising uh, his Principia. And um, in 1708 happens also the following. John Keel from Oxford, an acolyte of David Gregory, uh, presents two papers at the Royal Society, one on metatheory that will exert uh, the reaction of Christian Wolff and the criticism of the Leibnizians. So because this group in Oxford to which Kills belonged uh, had interest in medicine, metatheory, and so on and so forth. So they were against Leibniz for many reasons, also for political reasons, actually. They had all reasons to be against Leibniz. But another paper is a paper where, where we read hec omnia secuntur ex celebratissima nunc dierum fluxionum arithmetica, which without any doubt for first was invented, uh, the Mr. Newton uh, invented. And, uh, oh, and um, the same arithmetic um, um, was uh, edited in the Acta Ruditorum by Mr. Leibniz, uh, after uh, a change in uh, name and notation. And this is the, what sparked the polemic and what led to the Commercium Epistolicum. That's, of course, well known to all of you. What's not uh, noticed too frequently is that uh, the topic is uh, the laws of centripetal force and what Kiel does here is to use the method of fluxions in order to solve the problem of determining a trajectory of a body which moves <coughs> accelerated by a force which varies with the inverse of the square of the distance. I have to use this long way. I cannot say the motion of a body in an inverse square force field because otherwise it wouldn't, it wouldn't be red. It would be, <laughs> uh, no, uh, <laughs> glowing something. <laughs> Fire, <laughs> let us say so. But in any case, um, uh, this is interesting. Again, like Fazio, Hill faces a typical problem of the Principia, the problem of the Principia, if you like. You know, the problem of determining a trajectory of a body in an inverse square force field. <laughs> and he accuses Leibniz there. So th there is, you know, a pattern here. People who know Newton relate Newton's method of fluxions to the Principia. Also because the Continentals were doing such a fantastic job in this field with Varignon, Johann Bernoulli. They were doing a lot of work in Newtonian mechanics in 
calculus terms using the differential calculus of Leibniz and the integral calculus of Leibniz. From the correspondence of codes, it is clear that, to me, that clear that Coates worked with a copy of the first edition of the Principia, annotated, we believe, we don't know which copy, I think, Coates used. And he had beside it the Tractatus de Quadratura Curvarum. And he used the, the tables that end the Tractatus de Quadratura Curvarum that were uh, in, in Newton's, uh, that, that were in the De Methodis of 1671. So he was using integration techniques that predate the Principia. <coughs> and he does so in some letters, in the first extant letters, actually, Coates writes, I found that this proposition is true by the tables of fluence, that is the table of integrals, such and such. So there were important changes in the second edition, and I will not uh, talk about this uh, because, uh, because of reasons of times. But uh, so the, the, the second edition is very interesting for a mathematician because it includes many improvements. The text is really a new text, is an improved text from a mathematical point of view. <coughs> Yet, the appendix on quadratures discussed with Gregory and in the correspondence with Coates is missing. So in a way, for me, the second edition is a bit an anticlimax because uh, I am glad to understand by Dr. Bentley that you have some thoughts of adding to this book as multitudes of infinite series and the method of fluxing. I like the design very well. It's not published, so why is it so? The answer, this is Newton's answer. In the account to, to the Commercium Epistolicum, la, uh, Newton, sorry, this is Newton's answer. In the account to the Commercium Epistolicum, he writes, by the help of the new analysis, Mr. Newton found out most of the propositions in his Principia Philosophiae. But because the ancients, for making things certain, admitted nothing into geometry before it was demonstrated synthetically, he demonstrated the proposition synthetically that the system of the heavens might be founded upon good geometry. The great historian of Newton and one of the great uh, experts on the Newton Leibniz controversy and of the correspondence of Newton, Rupert Hall, calls it the fable of fluxions. And uh, of course, Hall is right. This is a fable. And Newton is like a Pinocchio with a long nose here. It's not true <laughs> that he wrote the Principia and then translated it into geometry. He, there is some reasons that to think that in some cases he used the, the method of fluxions in certain propositions, but not generally, so to speak. It is a fable, but um, Hall's statement with all the admiration that we have with Hall should not stop our dialogue with this text. Any statement in history that prevents us from interrogating further texts is something that is not good. After all, Fables are fascinating, not only for children, but also for historians. And I found the study of this fable interesting. The language in which it is expressed is strange. It, it needs explanation. What does new analysis mean? Why is he referring to the ancients? What is this notion of certainty? And why is Newton saying that his publication policy is similar to that of the ancients? So there are many questions here that uh, is interesting to uh, ask ourselves. And uh, 
the study of these uh, statements that Newton made concerning the method of fluxions, even though they were expressed in the heated context of the priority dispute was with Leibniz, tell us something about Newton's agendas, about Newton's ideas of mathematics. Perhaps, as historians of mathematics, we have too much focused on achievement and coherence, and we forget the importance of indecision and, ab and ambivalence, let us say so. But uh, even though studying Newton's statements about mathematics is, uh, I think, a worthy enterprise, even though basically Newton was lying here, it's interesting to understand how he was lying, why he was lying this way, let us say so. Even though these statements are interesting, do they teach us anything about the general scholium? Not much, I feel a bit guilty here because I haven't taught you anything about the general scholium yet. <laughs> so let us leave the word, and here I arrive to the conclusion huh, in a moment. So you can see that there is the conclusion. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, the last three pages of Newton's anonymous account, as it has already been noted by several speakers, and with uh, a kind of general scolium within the commercium, if you like. Newton begins, uh, these are three pages in which uh, Newton begins, at a certain moment he abandons the forensic uh, uh, problems concerning the priority, he abandons the interesting uh, philosophical methodological questions concerning the geometry of the ancients and the role of symbolism and uh, and uh, the superiority of his method over those of that of Leibniz and limits against infinitesimals and so on and so forth. And he begins abruptly like this. The philosophy which Mr. Newton has pursued is experimental. And he goes on to explain what is experimental philosophy. And then he says on page, uh, and on the penultimate page of uh, the, uh, the, the account, he says, Mr. Leibniz has accused him of making gravity a natural and essential property of bodies and an occult quality and miracle. And by this sort of raillery, they are persuading the Germans that Mr. Newton wants judgment and was not able to invent the infinitesimal method. And then you turn the page and it must be allowed that these two gentlemen differ very much in philosophy. And they, so these are very famous pages. So, I hope I have convinced you that the debate on the priority in the invention of the calculus that was synchronous with the philosophical debate that informs the general scolium was a chance for exchanging interesting mathematical ideas and for debating philosophical issues related to the nature of mathematical thought and its application to natural philosophy that can rival the interest of the theological and philosophical themes <coughs> that Newton broached in the concluding pages of the second edition of his Principia. Is there any relationship between the two debates? Newton's were troubled times, and the highly controversial theological, political, and philosophical issues that informed the general scholium were not alien to the confrontation that divided the mathematical community and that were incepted by the Commercium Epistolicum. The actors involved in the two debates were very much the same. Kiel, for instance. Yet, the two debates are logically independent. Even though it is not easy to identify the evident relationships or influences between the themes broached in the general scolium and those that were debated in the context of the calculus priority dispute, unless we are too prone to facile generalizations, I share with the scholars gathered in this room the idea that our image of Newton's Principia and its contested reception would be skewed and partial had we concentrated only on the concluding pages of its second edition. After all, one of our main purposes is to read the general scolium in context, and the story I told you is very much part of this context, even though we cannot say that we have found anything philosophically 
relevant about the relationships between mathematics and theology, for instance, in at least in the talk I have given you. And I would like to really come to a conclusion with a quotation that is a bit ridiculous because it's a quotation from Stefan Collini, who is, of course, a, a great intellectual historian, so it's a bit ridiculous too. But uh, I, 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 while I was preparing this talk, I was reading one of his books, and I came across this quotation that might indeed end uh, <laughs> my talk. And the quotation is this. He writes, instead of works which cut a vertical and often theological slice through the past, the tendency of recent works that he approves has been towards excavating a more horizontal side, exploring the idioms and preoccupation of a past period as they manifest themselves in thought and discussion about various issues that cannot readily be assigned to current academic pigeonholes. So I like to think that the organizers of this workshop share with Collini this idea that we have to excavate horizontally. And it is because of their horizontal excavation that they have reached me, a historian who is, uh, let us say, like a little package uh, posted in a different pig academic pigeonhole uh, in order to attain a description of past thought that I hope was enriched by the material, logically and philosophically independent, but synchronous, that I presented you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicolo, for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that, uh, that the tradition of saying this is the answer doesn't end with Newton. I mean, Laplace is very famous for saying, it can be easily shown that. And of course, we're all familiar with, this has been left as an exercise for the student. So, um, the first question, Andrew. Oh, I've never been first. What is her, my name on the I felt like <laughs> Thank you so much. I always struggle to take notes quickly enough to get all of these great Yeah. But Insights if, if down I will not the veto the, the video, <laughs> because I have, <laughs> I have the, uh, uh, somehow the, the, the desire to cancel it forever, but uh, you <laughs> might. Uh, yes. Well, we can, Perhaps we we might can spill some coffee it. on it later. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, this might be a very ignorant question, um, but I can't think of the exact answer. I know you will know. So we. We know part of Newton's debate with Descartes about mathematics is indicated in what you said earlier, that Descartes thought he invented a better method than the ancients, and this obviously was greatly upsetting to Newton, at least at some points in his life. But then you read a quote from the account, I think, that struck me as very intriguing. Did Newton also think that Leibniz was guilty of a similar error in his mathematical methods? And if so, that might be a connection between a few of the different elements in, 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 yeah. your, in your talk. Well, actually, Newton, um, it is in the 1670s, late 1670s, that Newton developed a lot of rhetorical devices against the modern mathematicians to which Descartes belonged. When the priority with Leibniz was incepted, <laughs> Newton reused some of this material against Leibniz. Um, and he often referred to Leibniz and Leibniz's followers as the modern mathematicians who are not trained in geometry any longer and they are the bunglers of mathematics and so on and so forth. So there is a certain continuity, but it is uh, a very sad thing that in those years Skype did not exist because had Newton knew more about Descartes or about Leibniz, he would have found them sharing <laughs> many of his ideas concerning geometry and the ancients actually. And uh, Leibniz is also the mathematician of the analysis situs in which he tries to you know, develop uh, and 
an approach to mathematics, uh, perhaps inspired by the work on projective geometry, even though it is not clear. But uh, uh, Leibniz was also interested in developing geometrical thinking. And certainly, if you, uh, if you asked him about Archimedes, he would have been uh, very appreciative towards Archimedes. Um, so I, I think that, uh, yes, Newton built a straw man, you know, in a certain sense, both in the case of Descartes and in the case of Leibniz. He didn't know the complexity, and, the, and he, he probably was not aware of the philosophical sophistication of Descartes and Leibniz's philosophies of mathematics. That probably, I think, we are a little bit above his head, philosophically speaking, you know, from this point of view at least. Sorry, will you, would you, do you have a question, Eric? Uh, Dimitri Dimitri, then. context is Barrow. Yes. Now Barrow also rewrites the history of, of mathematics and wh what, wh what is he doing that for? Because for the Cartesians there's no problem with their philosophy. They have prima philosophia metaphysics. For Barrow there's a big problem because experimental philosophy, as we were just talking with Eric, doesn't seem to be philosophy at all on the mm -hmm. standard definition of yeah. philosophy. So what does Barrow do? He says that geometry is the science of real number of number as real quantity, yeah. and he rewrites the history of mathematics yeah. uh, to make mathematics this master discipline which yeah. encompasses natural philosophy. But that's very awkward. So for example, he has to say that all the ancients subsumed uh, arithmetic to geometry. Yeah. The problem is all the ancient sources say the exact opposite, that arithmetic and geometry were quite separate. And so Barrow has to play this very convoluted scholarly trick where he uses a very obscure Pythagorean philosopher called Archytas, mm -hmm. who, he's, who, who there's a quotation yeah. says that uh, uh, arithmetic is the sister of geometry, yeah, yeah. and Barrow has to claim that all the ancients believe yeah. this. Might it be possible that what Newton is doing in uh, the two geometrical books, when he talks, the unpublished ones, when he talks about the history of what he calls rational mechanics, he's trying to do the same thing as Barrow, but write a much more convincing uh, history. Yeah. That is to say, to use Papus and this yeah. idea that Papus yeah. is doing something natural, philosophical, yeah. uh, mechan what he calls yeah. rational mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the Barrow enterprise, but, but much more nicely yeah. done. It's, um, it's a pity that uh, Jan Stewart could not stay here because he is, you know, the person who <coughs> would have an answer to this question, which is a very good question. Actually, yes, I think that uh, Barrow's influence is uh, momentous on Newton. And uh, there are several interesting things about your question. One is that you are correct to talk about histories of mathematics. In this period of great transition of mathematics, of anxiety about this discipline that was, you know, the, the icon of, of, of certainty, and it was changing. And uh, uh, <coughs> mathematicians tried to define genealogies and histories of mathematics and tried to place themselves into a narrative, let us say so. Um, and Barrow, of course, forced the history of mathematics in favor of geometry. Of course, um, we are often taught, we are sometimes taught, that those who defended geometry were backward-looking people, and uh, they were those who were doing the wrong thing. Because we read the history of mathematics from the point of view of the 18th century, in which the analytical mode of doing the symbolical algebraic mode of doing mathematics was much more successful. But uh, if you step back 
in the 1660s in Cambridge, and uh, you are a professor of mathematics there, you would conceive a geometry as a much more general language compared to algebra, because uh, since uh, the interest of mathematician was in those period in plain curves, only a handful of plain curves were expressible in algebraic terms. The most general way to talk about plain curves was by geometrical or mechanical generation of curves. And uh, what uh, Barrow probably hammered in Newton's mind, even though we don't know much about their early relationship. Morty is, of course, an expert on this. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, Barrow had an, an enormous influence. I mean, there are terms in Barrow's mathematics that are that you find again in Newton's and so on and so forth. Uh, was able to hammer in Newton's had this idea that uh, algebra is a nice method of discovery, but you can use it only in certain cases. Geometry is more general. And uh, Newton had this advantage on Barrow. He, as a geometer, was able to develop ideas in projective geometry that were quite powerful, and therefore, uh, he was able to initiate a, a research program that Newton conceived as a research program directed towards um, uh, recovering the method of discovery of the ancients that was geometrical but preferable to the algebraic method of discovery. So geometry was not only the way in which you prove rigorously things, but was also a method for discovering things. To make a simple example, you can deal with conic sections in terms of algebraic equations. We all know, for instance, that the circle can be expressed as x to the square plus x, x to, uh, y to the square equal r to the square, let us say, so the, the equation of the circle. But you can talk about conic sections also in projective terms by conceiving co conic sections as shadow of a circle. So instead of using an equation for an ellipse or an equation for a, you, you conceive the ellipse and the hyperbola as projections of the circle. And if you know that certain properties are invariant by a projection, you prove them for the circle and then you transfer them to the conic sections because these properties do not vary. Now, uh, this simple example uh, is meant to, uh, to, to explain why for Newton projective geometry could be a method of discovery, alternative to algebra. And uh, so uh, we very often think, you know, we very often think about two things, that uh, geometry for uh, these people, contemporary of Newton's, was a way of proving. No, geometry could be a way of discovering. And we often think about algebra as the general thing because we project on algebra what algebraic way of thinking became one century later, actually. But in that moment, algebra was a little trick, a precious trick, but not a general thing. And in fact, in the Principia, Newton makes recourse to fluxions only in a few cases. And for him, it was obvious you know, that the general theory is the theory of uh, the limit of of uh, prime and ultimate ratios is geometry. And yes, from time to time, I have to use my method of fluxions, but it's, you know, a little tool that I use there. While for us, after Euler, the calculus is the language of, of analytic mechanics. When you do analytic mechanics, what you do is to write differential equations. And analytic mechanics after Euler is the integration of, anal of, of differential equations. But you know, um, this is how, you know, but, so, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say that there are modern mathematicians, particularly Arnold yes. and Lyndon Bell, who've proclaimed in recent years that the Newtonian method, the geometric method to them, is more expressive and more super and superior to the algebraic calculus. As far as they're concerned, and they're practicing mathematicians, yes. they believe it's a better method for them. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Sorry. Eric, uh, 
yes, that's a very important point that you mm -hmm. made. And the point that Peter made explains us how lucky we have to have a practicing mathematician, a practicing physicist with us. Because the, the, the things we are discussing uh, are still interesting and, uh, and, uh, still and inspiring. Still for, relevant. For, for, yeah. and another thing is Laplace makes a well-known statement saying Newton was the originator of all this. Uh, one moment, Eric. Newton was the originator of all this, but it would be wonderful to get a proper story of everything that's happened ever since uh, from all these geometers, by which he means Euler and Lagrange and himself. Yeah, yeah. And he calls them all geometers. Yeah. He doesn't say these calculus or algebrists, he says these sure. geometers. Sure. Anyway, Eric, uh, you, your chance now. Yeah, the, the, that comment is a ref rebuke to Diderot who had claimed that the age of geometry was about to end. Like Diderot had claimed yeah. um, that the age of geometry had, was, was ending, and he had named the very same people. Um, so <laughs> there, there, there was a French uh, in-joke there. Yeah. Um, none of, anyways, uh, my question is um, 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 on the notion of mathematical beauty that Newton has and develops, in part because uh, one aspect of Newton's design argument in the general scholium is an appeal to elegance. Yeah. And um, one question I have about how these, because you created a palimpsest for us in which these two texts shadow each other but perhaps not quite meet but maybe meet, um, the letters can be printed over each other. Um, to what degree do you think that the aesthetic version of the argument to design, from design, um, and uh, its appeal to elegance can actually be better understood or illuminated by Newton's thinking about uh, the superiority of ancient mathematics which it seems to me in part from reading your work uh, is not only uh, <laughs> uh, what works better, but also a matter of aesthetic judgment to yes. some degree. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you could use this few minutes to help us think about what aesthetic elegance would have meant for Newton. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is very important. Uh, there are many, many uh, places in uh, in the eight green books edited by Tom Whiteside, where you find Newton uh, talking uh, about algebra as ugly and geometry as beautiful, the geometry of the ancient as aesthetically superior, uh, more concise, uh, more elegant, uh, while algebra, in a, he says, provokes nausea, you see. And so he is very, uh, th this is an idea that Newton has and uh, um, it's, uh, it's important to appreciate that his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, choice for certain mathematical methods is uh, driven by what he thinks is more beautiful. Of course, there is one thing to say that uh, aesthetic criteria are very subjective in a way. So there are mathematicians who find algebra very beautiful, actually. So uh, it's uh, it's uh, so it's difficult to capture this thing. But again, I think that uh, these Newtonian statements, even though uh, their philosophical status is not so strong because of this subjective element, in my opinion, they are interesting because they tell us. Uh, something about Newton the man, uh, Newton, how he conceived mathematics and so on and so forth. But your question, I think, aims to saying that Newton might have preferred geometry because it is beautiful and so we have to apply geometry to the world in order to capture the beauty of the world. Yeah, this connects to the Barrow point, yeah. point as well. Yeah, but I think I don't see this. I rather see Newton as conceiving geometry as a human construct that helps us to construct geometrical objects uh, 
and uh, study them and perhaps uh, apply this construction to the study of nature, but um, uh, the natural world, in my opinion, did not have any, they don't have much, of the, I'm stepping in a field that is not mine, but I propose to you to look at Newton as a person who conceives the world as a messy thing where orbits are not, as Kepler thought, beautiful ellipses, but they are curves that are, you know, perturbed. And uh, the world that Newton depicts is a world of complexity, is a world in which is not written uh, in a way. Oh, well, the basic laws are mathematical, but uh, the effects of these basic laws is not mathematically perfect. So Newton is not, has no Pythagorean idea about reality, in my opinion. He has rather the idea that uh, geometrical objects have to be constructed in order to be known, really known. There is a quotation in which Newton says, the nature of a curve is better known by the manner of its construction. So if you know how to construct a curve, this is very similar to what Hobbes said, actually. There are analogies, very strong analogies. So if you know how to construct, because Newton's geometry, we have seen it, is a kinematic geometry. Uh, curves are traced by motion. And uh, if we know how to construct a curve, we know better the nature of the curve, the symptom, the symptom of the curve, as Newton would say. Instead, with algebra, we don't have this advantage. We have, algebra is, so to speak, a technique that, in his opinion, doesn't allow us to understand so deeply what a spiral is or what an ellipse is because you need a tracing mechanism to, to know it, yes. Thank you, Nicolò. The rewarding yes. uh, uh, presentation, and I would like to kind of go on a tangent, or ask you to go on a tangent, mm -hmm. because with all this interesting explanation of the beauty, the power, the depth uh, of geometry, there is one aspect that you did not touch on, and you know, as you yourself pointed out very eloquently, when Newton started it in the late 70s, it was in reaction to Descartes. Mm -hmm. So what I would like you to expound on is the process of inertia. Having started by attacking Descartes uh, and positing against him the power of geometry, that in a sense Newton is carried on almost by necessity with a project that he started as a reaction to Descartes. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, of course, is the, uh, uh, subsequently is augmented by a critique of Leibniz, who, in a sense, continues the Cartesian yeah. project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is an element here that, in a sense, can we say that, in addition to the thing that you already said, that, in a sense, he has no choice but to continue to defend the project he started as a reaction to Descartes, mm -hmm. and he's kind of he's getting bogged down mm -hmm. with it as he goes along, and there's no way out. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, there are, let us see if I, it's a very interesting question, actually. Let us say that um, in the first place, my impression after having read Newton's manuscripts on mathematics is that it is not easy to find a coherent attitude in Newton. Perhaps in this lecture or in my books, I am responsible for, for, for some simplifications, let us say. So we have to accept that Newton uh, uh, lived his uh, mathematical bio rich mathematical biography with uh, tensions and contradictions. As a young man, he was a Cartesian by formation. He began his career as a mathematician by reading not Descartes, but the annotation to Descartes, which is another thing, as my friend Sébastien Maron and David Rabouin are going to explain us that the geometry, the Latin geometry, was something where, for instance, 
Fermat method of tangent was explained rather than Descartes method. So van uh, Schoten was really creative uh, with his group in doing these things. And Newton was obtained his great <coughs> results starting from there. Then in the mid 1670s, late 1670s, Newton began reading Papus, uh, you know, the compilation uh, of um, Papus of Alexandria, uh, where he uh, began uh, being interested in uh, Euclid's porisms and began being interested in higher part of uh, ancient geometry that fascinated him as a mathematician. And he declined this new interest in anti-Cartesian terms, let us say. So it was, you know, uh, a, a springboard in order to claim I am not a, a Cartesian mathematician. But in the same time, his, his hand, his uh, creativity as a mathematician continued to push him into producing results in algebra and uh, integration techniques until the 1690s. So there is a tension between his mathematical, his agenda as a mathematician, his positioning himself into uh, a genealogy in which he says, I am not a modern mathematician, I am an heir of ancient geometry. But in the same time, his mathematical practice, even in the Principia, is sometimes powerfully influenced by highly symbolical algebraic techniques. How did he come to terms with this? By contradicting himself very often. So I think that as historian, rather than extracting a clear answer from your question, we have to be happy to describe the tormented life of this mathematician. Karen, a quick question from Karen. Yeah, while you're doing that, could I mention that he also uh, did Cartesian mathematics in the 1690s because he was still doing his enumeration of cubic curves. Absolutely. And that was directly Cartesian. Yeah, but in the same time, in that work, yeah. he classifies cubics in five projective classes, as well, yeah. which is a very powerful argument from projective geometry yes. that is there, you oh, see. Yes. So. Karen. Yeah, there is one aspect of this uh, debate between geometrical mind and algebraic mind in mathematics, which is always present, but has not been touched explicitly upon, and that's the difference in dealing with infinite quantities. Yeah. Of course, in geometry, and this, this has certainly to do also with the aesthetic appeal of geometry, in a certain sense, infinite quantities are given. You don't have to construct them, even not if you construct curves. You don't construct them in the same way as you would have to construct whatever quantity in an algebraic sense, it is there at once, and as well on the level of the infinitely big as of the, in the level of the infinitely small. So this has a very strong appeal, especially for people like Newton who want to apply mathematical tools to processes which involve somehow these, yeah. in algebraical terms, straightly paradoxical yeah. or clumsy yeah. or difficult or inconstructible or whatever kinds of quantities. And that's why you see, of course, this debate resurface at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century when the foundations of mathematics are anew called into question. And where Poincaré, for instance, explicitly points out this difference, the geometry, le, l'esprit géométrique et l'esprit algébrique dans les mathématiques. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, in the same time, to your question, I would answer with two observations. Thank you for your question. One is that uh, um, and I have another friend, Tony Mallet, who is uh, researching on the 17th century, and one of his theses that he's going to develop in uh, research that he's carrying out now is that um, for 17th century mathematicians, uh, in their mathematical practice, algebra and geometry were very much intertwined one to the other. For instance, the letter I've shown you here, but perhaps it's not a good idea to look at that, the, but uh, the letter I've I've shown you here um, allows me to explain what I mean. You see that Newton expresses force uh, as the inverse cube of the distance. But you see that at the numerator he writes h to the fourth. We would write a constant, k. He writes h to the fourth. Why? Because uh, this is a cube. This is a fourth power. This is a cube. 
And therefore, this object has uh, uh, dimension one. And force as an intensity, as an intensity has to be, you know, an ordinate. I mean, this is the distance, my distance from Hilary, and this is the force. It's, it's the intensity. As I, as I get closer, it grows, as I get, it, it diminishes. So the intensity of the force has to have dimension one. So they write algebra, but they think in, in geometric terms. And even a look at these pages shows you that there are a lot of words, a lot of geometrical objects here. And uh, geometry and algebra in the mathematical practice were much more intertwined than the debate between geometry and algebra might lead us to think. So, and, uh, and uh, that's it. So uh, I had to kill you with this. <laughs> that's the last, uh, that's the last, uh, no mercy. <laughs> so I think that's a, a good place to end this, this uh, discussion. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, can we thank uh, Nicola again for a wonderful talk and uh, a most interesting and illuminating one. Thank you very much.